Brooks and Cape Hard discuss GOP defense strategy and Biden's achievements at the NATO summit. Jeff Bennett is joined by David Brooks, a columnist for The New York Times, and Jonathan Cape Hart, an assistant editor for The Washington Post, to discuss the political news of the week, including President Biden's journey to Europe for the NATO summit, the GOP's defense strategy, and the 2024 election. We now turn to Brooks and Cape Hart's analysis to discuss President Biden's trip abroad this week in the 2024 election. David Brooks, a columnist for The New York Times, and Jonathan Cape Hart, an assistant editor for The Washington Post, are shown. It's nice to see both of you. Mr. David Brooks. Well, when he was president, Donald Trump said that NATO was obsolete. And that wasn't a totally crazy position. It seemed to me like we had it for the Cold War, and why do we need it now? Well, we have learned why it's not obsolete anymore. And Biden has really pinioned his presidency around this idea that we're in a contest between authoritarian governments and democratic governments. And he really has used a lot of different meetings in, with India and with others to try to advance the democratic side's cause. And no week was bigger than this one. Getting Sweden in over the previous objections of Turkey was significant. Getting more commitments for Ukraine was significant. The slowly developing consensus that Ukraine is not going to join NATO now, but after the war is over, it probably will, that's also significant. So, either case, he's expanding the Democratic camp. Jeff Bennett. What were your impressions? Jonathan Capehart. I have just, I have nothing to add to what David said, because, I mean, he lays it out perfectly. But I just want to talk about what the president did after the NATO summit and where he went, Helsinki, and the room he was in, the exact same room where, five years to the day earlier, then-President Donald Trump with Vladimir Putin standing right next to him, when asked about Russian interference in the election, he said, Well, I asked President Putin and he said it wasn't him. And I have no reason to believe, to believe otherwise. That was a thunderclap moment for the alliance, a thunderclap moment for the American people who care about the United States standing in the world, but also the American president standing up not just for the liberal small-d democratic order, but for the alliance and for the United States' role in the world. And there you have President Biden five years to the day later standing there clearly as not just the American president but the leader of an alliance that is standing firm against the aggression and authoritarianism of Vladimir Putin. And I just think that that is the cherry on top to what David just said about the President's week. Jeff Bennett On the matter of building a coalition of democracies and supporting Ukraine, there is a record high 44% of Republicans and GOP-leaning independents who say the U.S. is giving too much aid to Ukraine. This is according to a Pew Research survey released last month. And Republican presidential candidates have really seized on this wariness of the cost of the war. Do our allies have reason to be concerned about the durability of the U.S. commitment? David Brooks Yes. In the 1940s, Dwight Eisenhower was thinking of running for president, but he thought, well, there's this guy Robert Taft, a senator, a Republican senator. Maybe he will run and he wanted to know if Taft would support NATO, to basically support U.S. engagement abroad. And Taft wouldn't. And so Eisenhower decided to run as a Republican. And because of that move, the Republican Party over the ensuing decades was a pretty internationalist party, obviously, Reagan, George H. W. Bush. George W. Bush. The U.S. should exert power abroad. But now, over the last couple of years, the Republican Party has been returning to what was the pre-Eisenhower bias toward I don't want to say isolation, but let's take care of ourselves at home, suspicion of foreign alliances. And so for a while, we didn't have big polling gaps between Democrats and Republicans on how interventionist the U.S. should be. Now we really do. And so it's not just a Donald Trump thing. It's a lot of Republicans that said we should just not be wasting our money abroad. And that's an ancient war cry in America. But we had about 50 years without it. But now it's come back. Jonathan Capehart. I mean, David says Republicans, we should take care of our own at home. 
But the Republicans we're talking about today don't even want to take care of what's happening here in the country with a lot of the things that they have voted against. So, I just wanted to put that in there. I know I cut you off, Jeff. You were about to ask me something. Laughter. Jeff Bennett. Well, I was going to ask, one, what you thought about that. But, also, typically foreign policy doesn't really resonate in presidential elections. Will that change this year, this cycle, do you think, given what's happening in Ukraine? Jonathan Capehart. Sure. I mean, it very well might. I think the president's leadership makes it something that could be salient for the American people. But this is the other point I wanted to make in terms of the money and the concern of the American people, particularly Republicans, about all of the money that's being spent. I thought it was very important that President Zelensky, before he said anything when meeting with the president, thanked the American people for their support, and specifically thanked them, I thank you for your money, because he understands that it is a financial sacrifice for the American people, and he wants us to know that he knows that and realizes that, and that, when the president says, we will be with Ukraine no matter how long it takes, that Zelensky is like, hey, we appreciate it. Keep it coming. Jeff Bennett. On the matter of defense and money, Congress, as we heard earlier in the program, is considering the National Defense Authorization Act, which sets policy for the Defense Department. And the House narrowly approved its version last night, and it includes Republican provisions blocking abortion coverage, diversity initiatives at the Pentagon, transgender care. In years past, this was a bipartisan enterprise. What do you make of this effort by Republicans to use this bill as a cudgel in the culture wars and to really virtue signal to members of their base? David Brooks Yes, I mean, there are two things going on here. One is the amendments, which I'm basically fine with. Like, having the Pentagon pay for people to travel for abortion, that's a policy choice. The Pentagon made a policy choice. It's based on a set of philosophies and some other Republicans have a different philosophy, and so they can try to vote it down. And that's fine. That's, to me, that's the democratic process. The terrible thing that's happening with Senator Tuberville is blocking promotions until he gets his abortion policy correct. And that just weakens the military. It's fine to have a debate. It's fine to have amendments. It's fine to have a policy process. It's not fine to weaken our military because of your philosophy. And there's a, I'm doing a lot of history tonight. The ghost of Mark Shields is smiling upon me. Laughter. David Brooks. Abraham Kuyper was at 19th century or 20th century Dutch prime minister, and he had a thing called the philosophy of the spheres, that we have different spheres of life. Politics is over here. The military is over here. The media is over here. You ruin a society if you don't respect the differences of the spheres. And the military does its own thing by its own logic, by its own standards and should not have outsiders screwing up the way it does its business for an ideological culture war issue. Jeff Bennett President Biden has called on Republicans to talk to Tuberville, Senator Tuberville, to get him to change his ways here. It doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Jonathan Capehart. Yes. And the onus is on Senator Tuberville, because what he's doing is, it's shameful. It's reprehensible. It puts our national security at risk. And, sure, the Marine Corps Commandant in waiting can be acting, but this is the first time in, what, 150 that leaked memo from the DeSantis campaign shows that Governor DeSantis wants to focus now on Tim Scott, because they see what I see. Senator Scott is the one they should be worried about. That leaked memo from the DeSantis campaign shows that Governor DeSantis wants to focus now on Tim Scott, because they see what I see. Senator Scott is the one they should be worried about.